Nask here. So while perusing around on the internet, looking through a few different news and media sites, I stumbled across an interesting little article on Salon.com. Needless to say, I wasn't disappointed. The very headline of the article said enough, to be honest. Of course, gender is a factor. Being a woman is still Hillary Clinton's biggest liability. A lot of Americans think sexism is over because a woman got the Democratic nod for president. But they're wrong. So before even tackling the meat of the article, we can already see some issues with the potatoes. Firstly, there's a title, of course. Of course, gender is a factor. Except that it isn't. But we'll get to all of that later, I'm sure. Being a woman is still Hillary Clinton's biggest liability. So right away, we have a bit of confusion on the author's part. Hillary Clinton's biggest liability is certainly debatable. However, her gender is not one of them. There are many scandals and issues surrounding the Democratic presidential nominee, from her inconsistencies on policy, to her lies about occurrences both past and present, to the controversies surrounding the primaries, her emails, Benghazi, the DNC leaks, and very recently, her health. The second bit here is the claim that a lot of Americans think sexism is over because a woman got the Democratic nod for president. But they're wrong. Any Americans who do believe such a thing, of course they would be wrong. I'm sure I can say rather comfortably that a lot of Americans don't think sexism is over, for whatever the reason, but certainly not just because a woman is a presidential nominee. Sexism, like racism and every other kind of prejudice and ism in the world, will always exist, at least until mankind no longer exists, or every last one of us is lobotomized for whatever reason. With that out of the way at least, we can get into the heart of the article itself, finally, and go through it thoroughly, bit by bit, and address each of its reasonings and explanations as they come up. Sexism and misogyny in American politics. Real or Bigfoot? A bit of both, I would imagine. For a good chunk of the electorate, sexism is a feminist fantasy, and the irrefutable proof is the fact that Hillary Clinton is a Democratic nominee for president. These same people tend to argue that Barack Obama's very existence means that anti-black racism is a liberal myth, and e pluribus unum means God save President Trump. After November, there's a good chance it will. In order to clarify, however, it has to be noted that this good chunk of the electorate do not believe that sexism in and of itself is a fantasy. Sexism certainly exists. What they believe, however, is the feminist idea of how much sexism exists and what form it takes is a fantasy. Modern third wave feminism especially fervently pushes the narrative that women in this country and throughout other modern Western democratic nations are being held down and oppressed by an invisible, unseen, and unprovable force called the patriarchy, a system exclusively meant for the benefit of men at the expense of women, giving all men, regardless of circumstance or status, an innate privilege over women. Hillary Clinton being the Democratic nominee for president doesn't prove that sexism is non-existent. But in addressing the third-wave feminist claim of a patriarchy, institutional and systemic sexism, it is a damning piece of evidence against such a thing, to be sure, as no such a system would ever allow a woman to gain so much power and influence. As for the part of the previous statement regarding Obama and Trump, it is, as a whole, a nonsensical and intentionally misrepresentative claim. As stated before, racism, like sexism and all other isms and prejudices, will always exist in one form or another always relegated to individuals and their own personal thoughts. Obama's existence doesn't mean racism is non-existent. His place as the President of the United States, holding the highest political and military office in the nation, does, however, disprove many far-left social justice narratives of systemic and institutional racism, very much as Hillary Clinton's position disproves the idea of a patriarchy. No such systems would ever, in any circumstance, allow these people to get where they have. As for Trump, in its own respect, it is somewhat true. Donald Trump is very much a populist, anti-establishment nominee running for president. He regularly attracts crowds of massive numbers to his rallies, regardless of where in the country he holds them, as compared to the very small numbers Hillary brings in. The phrase, e pluribus unum, the motto of the United States, translates to, out of many, one. In regards to the idea of public opinion, public enthusiasm, and public outreach, when considering the kind of crowds and energy Trump attracts, he certainly seems to have a larger and more diverse level of support among voters. On to the next bit. Tonight, however, the mythical beast called sexism may peek out and show itself, as the fact of Clinton on stage with Trump may force unrealistic expectations to face the burden of the impossible paradox. A woman in public life. As imagined by writer Charles Clymer, Clinton is expected to not only meet but exceed standards that verge upon the surreal. Immediately, we see an issue with this statement. That somehow, being a woman in public life, 
Clinton may be forced to deal with unrealistic expectations because of sexism. This statement alone is fraught with disingenuous claims. Clinton's position as a person who has been involved with politics for the majority of her life is the primary and overwhelming factor in regards to the expectations placed upon her. Not to mention the fact that as a candidate for president, she will, as every candidate in the past, be subject to an extreme level of inquiry and scrutiny. As a candidate for the highest office in the land, Clinton will, of course, be expected to meet and exceed everyday standards, same as Donald Trump will, which is why so often he is criticized for his lack of experience in the political sphere, and why foreign policy remains one of his weaker points in the polls in comparison to Clinton. Sexism is not an issue in this regard, as both candidates are investigated, scrutinized, and questioned regarding past claims, experience, and inconsistencies in their policies and stances. What this statement seems to suggest, however, is that somehow, Simply because she is a woman, Clinton should not have to face these challenges to her integrity, her character, or her positions. In essence, it comes across as claiming that simply due to being a woman, the bar and standards should be lowered for Clinton in order to suit her rather than suit the concerns of the voting public. Almost as if criticizing Hillary Clinton shouldn't be allowed because it could cost her votes and support in the general election. Such as how so many of her recent scandals and inconsistencies have already chipped away at her support and put her essentially on par with Donald Trump in national polling. We then move into the following. Hillary Clinton's greatest political liability is simply that she is not a man. According to her Twitter bio, she is wife, mom, grandma, women and kids advocate, floatus, senator, sex state, hair icon, pantsuit aficionado, 2016 presidential candidate. Her list is both cumulative and compound. Like Ryan Fleisch, I don't fucking know, fuck you German, the now defunct German word for law for the delegation of beef labeling, each thing sticks to the previous bit, and none of it ever goes away. Once a mother, always a mother. Pantsuits accepting, same goes for the rest of who she used to be and who she currently is. But in Clinton's alphabet self-portrait, wife comes first and presidential candidate comes last highlighting the fact that society still expects women to fulfill traditional familial roles in addition to saving the world. Immediately, the author is reinforcing the claim that being a woman is Clinton's biggest political liability while seemingly ignoring the decades worth of scandals that follow her. It then moves into quoting Hillary Clinton's Twitter bio, calling it cumulative and compound, which is true in a certain respect, but does little to really highlight herself and her career. And with Twitter bios only available to be so long, seems to be putting forward primarily the idea of Clinton being family-oriented in a somewhat obvious yet subtle appeal to the family values voters. It is in the second paragraph where we come into the nonsense, where it is stated that in Clinton's alphabet self-portrait, wife comes first and presidential candidate comes last highlighting the fact that society still expects women to fulfill traditional familial roles in addition to saving the world. However, it isn't society's expectations that dictate how Hillary Clinton or, more likely, her staff write her social media bio. The only one who inevitably dictates and confirms what is written there is Clinton herself. This list can just as easily be an appeal to more traditional family values voters as it could be to a random set of aspects in her life in some random order, both personal and professional. While polling and public opinion may influence how she presents policy, society cannot affect what Clinton herself, or by her command to staffers, dictate its expectations in how Hillary alone presents herself on something as minor and innocuous as a Twitter bio. Continuing, the article reads, On Twitter, Rachel Held Evans, author of A Year of Biblical Womanhood, has been steadily pointing out the sexist double standards applied to Clinton. Don't tell me gender isn't a factor when Hillary Clinton is more despised for being cheated on than Trump is despised for cheating, Evans tweeted on the heels of stating flatly, so angry at evangelicals who support shaming Hillary for Bill's affairs but shrug off Trump's chronic infidelity, hypocritical sexist BS. For many traumatized American women, this election season has felt like an extended immersion in collective public gaslighting, mouths agape. They watched as a manipulative and dystopian fantasy has swept over half the country into a narrative more believable than any lived truth because reality has long been what a white man says it is. Funny how the author suddenly feels the need to bring race into it. However, the statement is, in and of itself, misdirecting the issue. Hillary Clinton is not despised and hated by so much of the public due to Bill Clinton's sexual scandals. It is overwhelmingly due to the years of evidence supporting the idea that Hillary herself was complicit in these scandals as well as actively working against those her husband had abused and harassed in order to discredit, degrade, and insult them into remaining quiet over the years. While Trump's accused infidelity is a sticking point for plenty of people, for plenty of others, 
Clinton's willful acts of intimidation and lack of integrity in defending her husband, who could likely be considered a sexual deviant or as far as a rapist, is what most seems to irk her detractors, particularly women, especially women who have suffered at the hands of sexual abuse and assault, who feel that Hillary is not genuinely concerned with their struggles. While Trump may be criticized for his several marriages, many, even the evangelicals, can reasonably see it as more of a slight to defend a womanizer and attack their victims. This article, however, seems to be making an attempt to spin the story in a way to presume that Bill was never unfaithful and that Hillary had never worked against the lived experiences of those who suffered sexual assault and rape at the hands of either her husband or others. The next few paragraphs will be skipped over as they essentially go into discussing comparisons between chimpanzee groups and Donald Trump, dismissing them almost outright as stupid and pointless, while drawing comparisons to bonobo communities and essentially praising them, being female-led and controlled through ganging up on unruly males as well as using sex as a method of control. Honestly though, if you're going to be making comparisons, I don't think this works well under the usual feminist narrative of strong, independent women that don't have to use sex to get what they want. Either way, the article then moves on to pointing out that Hillary is doing better in polls among women than Trump is, which is essentially true. It then moves on to state that not all women support Hillary, of course. Millions are voting for Trump. This is the U.S. of A. Diversity of opinion and a diverse population make this country great. But as Propane Jane tweeted earlier this year, the lesson of Obama in 08 and 12 is that women and people of color finally have the numbers and power to beat white rage at the ballot box. The initial obvious issue with this statement is that white rage was somehow a thing. The electorate is massive and widely diverse. People of every color and gender are supporting both candidates to varying degrees. Hillary's support among women is strong, but not overwhelmingly so. Same with her support among African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, which seem to pale in comparison to the minority support that Obama received in the last two elections. The idea of white rage only really comes about recently as racial tensions in this country are exacerbated by such divisive anti-white groups like Black Lives Matter, Third Wave Feminism, and other far-left social justice organizations and ideologies. With so much attention on these groups, white Americans are generally made to feel more and more that the Democratic Party and the left in general not only moves to degrade and threaten them, but also to strip them of their voices, causing a major rift in the left-wing political ideologies between the progressive and liberal groups, with many liberals appropriately seeing this new form of the Democratic Party as divisive and authoritarian. As such, this sentiment is regularly driving many liberals to voting third party, not voting at all, or voting even for Donald Trump due to the rise of divisive, racialized rhetoric from the regressive left, pushing to restrict our basic freedoms in the name of political correctness and punish those who do not comply. This election will essentially boil down to a battle between two main aspects, the establishment status quo, or not, and the ideals of authoritarian policies or libertarian ones. Hillary Clinton is very much an establishment candidate pandering to the demands of the authoritarian left, while Donald Trump is essentially her opposite. Bernie Sanders was, to lesser degrees, an opposing position to Clinton's as well, being a much more varied group of viewpoints, which is why his supporters are splitting off into their varying camps of Trump, Clinton, third party, or no one. Sanders' supporters will be a key force in the upcoming general election, to be sure. The article ends by stating, the bigger question is whether there is sufficient political will for these groups to collectively band together, or if ideological squabbling and urban tribalism will let white raids win. The real maddening bit? No matter who wins, the chimpanzee candidate or the bonobo nominee in this Chinese year of the monkey, which 2016 happens to be, it's hard to shake off the feeling that we the people are going to get royally screwed. I have to hand it to the author for at least recognizing that regardless of who wins, Trump or Clinton, there will be an upheaval of sorts in the domestic and political spheres of this country, where the general population could take the brunt of the negative effects. However, it's the first bit that I personally take issue with. They push again at the idea of white rage, which as a concept is very recent given the social and political climate. In this last paragraph, the usual social justice ideas of collectivism really come out. Questioning essentially whether or not these non-white, non-male groups can disregard their individualism and independent opinions, and instead come together in a single mindset. It is this very kind of narrative that instigates this white rage, and causes larger divides within every kind of community, be it black or white, man or woman, straight or not, and all other varieties of identity. The very idea only serves to divide people, and once they have been divided, will inevitably shift to dividing amongst themselves as well. Hillary Clinton being a woman is absolutely not her greatest liability in this election, 
She has no greatest liability, but instead a plethora of them, from her scandals, to her health, to her embracing talking points and narratives of the regressive left. She moves forward in this election with decisions that can only serve to further divide the electorate and weaken her own support.